Thus far with motion of masses on a spring, we've been looking at free motion, free damped and free undamped. Now we're going to take a look at the question, how do we model vibrations with a driving force? In other words, we're going to take our differential equation that we've been working with, mx prime prime plus cx prime plus kx equals f of t, and now we're going to finally look at the case where the f of t is not equal to zero. And it turns out that machines with rotating components often involve mass spring systems with an external force of the form f of t is equal to some amplitude of the driving force cosine of some period times t, omega times t. So let's do an example where we look at this. Let's say I've got a mass of 2 kilograms. I've got a dash pot that provides 8 newtons of resistance. And I've got a spring constant k equals 26. And with an external force of 530 cosine of 4t being applied. And we're going to have initial conditions that the initial position is uh, 1 meter to the right of equilibrium and the initial velocity x prime is equal to 2 in the positive direction. All right. So there's lots of pieces here. Scrolling up to give us a little bit of space then to work this problem, we know that we can take the mass times the second derivative plus the dash pot's resistance times the first derivative plus the spring constant times x equals that driving force of 530 cosine of 4t. What we end up with then is a linear differential equation with constant coefficients that we're going to have to use the method of undetermined coefficients to find the particular solution. We know how to do all of that from our previous chapter. Let's solve it. Divide by 2 to get x prime prime plus 4x prime plus 13x equals 215, nope, 265, sorry, 265 cosine of 4t. To find the complementary solution, we'll look at the homogeneous case of d squared plus 4d plus 13 equals 0. We can, can't factor, so we can either complete the square or use the quadratic formula. With that middle term being even, I'm going to use the complete the square method by subtracting 13 and adding half of 4 squared. Half of 4 is 2, squared is 4 to both sides. So we get d plus 2 squared equals negative 9. And if we take the square root and subtract 2, we get negative 2 plus or minus 3i for our solutions. We know this means that x complement then is going to be e to the negative 2t times constant 1 times the cosine of 3t plus constant 2 times the sine of 3t. 
but we still need to find our particular solution. And we can use either the blue or the green line to find the particular solution. I'm going to just go ahead and use the blue, just because it's the original problem. Um, X particular. Seeing a cosine over there in the method of undetermined to of coefficients tells me that cosines come in pairs. So it's going to be a cosine of 4t plus b sine of 4t. And then we need the first and second derivatives. So we've got negative 4a sine of 4t plus 4b cosine 4t. And the second derivative is negative 16 a cosine 4t and negative 16 b sine of 4t. Using the coefficients of the original problem, we have 2 of the x prime primes, 8 of the x primes, and 26 of the x's. So that's what I'm going to multiply on both sides. And when I do that, I see we're going to end up with some terms that have cosine of 4t on them and some terms that have sine of 4t on them. So we've got 26a on the cosine, 26b on the sine, negative 32a on the sine, 32b on the cosine, negative 32a on the cosine, and negative 32b on the sine. If we add up the cosines on the a's, we have negative 6a plus 32b, and we know we want 530 of these cosines. Adding up the signs, we've got negative 32a minus 6b is equal to 0 because we don't want to have any signs in our result. And this isn't going to solve quickly with substitution or elimination, so I'm just going to use matrix operations to conclude that a equals negative 3 and b equals 16. And so that's going to give me my x particular solution. x particular is equal to negative 3 cosine of 4t plus b, which is 16, sine of 4t. So we now have x complement and x particular. We can add them together to get x. x is equal to e to the negative 2t times c1 cosine of 3t plus c2 sine of 3t plus x particular, which is negative 3 cosine of 4t plus 16 sine of 4t. Now we're ready to use these initial conditions to actually solve for our constants c1 and c2. So we have x prime is equal to, using the product rule, negative 2 e to the negative 2t times c1 cosine of 3t plus c2 sine of 3t plus, first times the derivative of the second, e to the negative 2t times, derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we have negative 3c1 sine of 3t plus 3c2 cosine of 3t. All right, moving on to the rest, uh, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we end up with positive, 3 times 4 is 12, sine of 4t plus 4 times 16 is 64, cosine of 4t. All right. We are given initial positions highlighted in blue of 0, 1, 
and 0 comma 2. So let's scroll down and plug those values in and see what we got. When we plug 0 in, the cosines become 1 and the sines are going to become 0. So I'm just going to mark the cosines as 1 and the sines as 0 to help me not miss any terms. So when x is 1, e to the 0 is 1, so we have c1 plus 0 minus 3 plus 0. So that tells me c1 is equal to 4. On the second equation, x prime is 2 when time is 0. So we have negative uh, 2 c1 plus 0 plus 3c2 plus 0 plus 64. If c1 is 4, we've got 2 equals negative 8 plus 3c2 plus 64. Uh, 64 minus 8 is 56. 2 minus 56 is negative 54. Negative 54 divided by 3 is negative 18. So C2 must be 18. And we finally have our constants. And so we can say our equation, completed equation describing the motion of this mass on a spring is e to the negative 2t times c1, which is 4, cosine of 3t, plus c2, which is negative 18, sine of 3t, minus 3, cosine of 4t, plus 16, sine of 4t. And while we technically now have an equation that represents the motion of the mass on the spring, I want to combine our cosine plus sine and cosine plus sine into single signs. So we're going to have a single sign for the complementary case and a single sign for the particular case. And we know how to do this. We know that c squared is equal to 4 squared plus negative 18 squared, which if I do that on my calculator is 340. So c is equal to the square root of 340. Then we know that the cosine of alpha is the sine part divided by c. And the sine of alpha is the cosine's coefficient divided by c. And because the cosine is negative and the sine is positive, I know I'm up here in the second quadrant. So to get there, I'm going to use cosine inverse of negative 18 divided by the square root of 340. And so my alpha is 2.9. 229. So when I put that together, we got x is equal to our constant is the square root of 340. Don't forget that e to the negative 2t part. And then as a single sign, it's the sine of 3t plus alpha 2.9229 plus now we'll do the particular solution part, where c squared is equal to negative 3 squared plus 16 squared. On the calculator, 3 squared plus 16 squared is 265. So c is the square root of 265. So we can say the cosine of alpha is sine's coefficient divided by c, 265. And the sine of alpha is the negative 3 divided by the square root of 265. This time, cosine is positive and sine is negative, which means I want to end up in the fourth quadrant. And I know sine inverse will stick me in the fourth quadrant. So I'm going to do sine inverse of negative 3 divided by the square root of 265. And that tells me that alpha is equal to negative... 0.1853.
And so if we put the second part together, we have our C, which is the square root of 265, sine of 4t, plus alpha, which is a negative 0.1853. And now we have an equation to describe the motion of my mass on a spring. If we were to graph this equation, what we end up with is we can see our initial point here at time 0 and up at 1. And then there's an initial velocity going up. And then eventually it becomes what almost looks periodic, almost like perfect harmonic motion. What's happening here? is the initial spring release causes its little vibration. But overall, the driving force, which is consistent, is going to eventually take over and give us a consistent, predictable graph that's going to follow this curve. Now, sometimes it takes longer or shorter to reach that harmonic motion. But that's what the driving force is going to do, is eventually it's going to take over, and the initial conditions are going to become a mute point. Before we wrap up here, I want to take a look at a second application that fits in nicely here because the differential equation actually is exactly the same as the differential equation that we saw with vibrations. And that's with electric circuits. We're going to take a look at what are called RCL circuits. And we're not going to get into the details of how the circuits work or what they do. I'll save that for your physics instructor. The idea that we're going to go into is going to be really surface so we can focus on the differential equation that models it. We're going to have some battery that's going to release E volts of energy onto a circuit. And usually there's a switch at some point in the circuit. And when that switch is turned on or the circuit is closed and it's connected, the energy will run through this thing that we're going to use the letter C on that represents the capacitor. Then it will continue down the circuit into what we're going to call L or the inductor. Then it continues down the circuit into what we call R or the resistor. until it closes the circuit back to the battery and continues in a loop. A couple notes on current and charge. Current, we're going to use the capital letter I to represent current, is the derivative of the charge which we're going to use the letter Q to represent the charge. In other words, what we're saying is Q prime is equal to I. The derivative of the charge is the current. The current describes how the charge is changing. Another thing that we need to know about this model is that the amount of voltage we have will drop at each point. It drops at C, it drops at L, it drops as R as it goes through each of these. What's interesting is how it drops. The inductor, which is L, ends up dropping proportionately to the derivative of the current. It drops L I prime. Well, if I, if Q is the derivative of I, this is the same as saying L Q prime prime. Also, the resistor, which was the R, drops proportional to the current, Ri. And since I is the derivative of Q, we could write this as Rq prime. Finally, the capacitor, which we use C, drops inversely proportional to the charge. 1 over C times Q the charge. And there's no substitution to do there, but it equals 1 over CQ. This all is going to come together in what is called Kirchhoff's law, which states that the voltage drop 
is equal to the total voltage. In other words, the using these three parts on the end here, the total there, LQ prime prime plus RQ prime plus 1 over CQ is going to equal the total voltage, which we said we were going to represent with E, the total volts on the battery. This then becomes a differential equation to model the electric current and the charge going through this RCL circuit. What's nice about this is it's in the exact same form as our differential equations representing motion with a driving force. So let's do an example. Let's say we've got an RCL current where R is equal to 12 ohms. L is equal to 2 Henry's. RC is going to be equal to 0 0.0625. And the voltage we're dealing with is 8E to the negative 3T. Putting this together to build our differential equation, L is 2, Q prime prime, plus R is 12, Q prime, Plus, we want the reciprocal of C, and so if it's a nice number, and this time it is, 1 divided by 0 0.0625 is a beautiful 16Q, is equal to E. E is the voltage of 8E to the negative 3T. And again, we now have a differential equation with constant coefficients, second order, and linear. It's non-homogeneous, so we're going to have to use the method of undetermined coefficients to find a particular solution, but we know how to do all of these skills. So let's run through it. I'm going to go ahead and divide everything by 2. Gives me Q prime prime plus 6Q prime plus 8Q equals 4E to the negative 3T. Finding the characteristic equation, D squared plus 6D plus 8 equals 0 in order to find our complementary solution. This one factors nicely. d plus 2, d plus 4 equals 0. So d is negative 2 and negative 4. We know if we have two distinct solutions, q is equal to the first constant. Actually, this is the complementary solution. e to the negative 2t plus the second constant, e to the negative 4t. Because we've got that 8e to the negative 3t, our particular number for q, or the charge, is going to be ae to the negative 3t. q particular prime is negative 3ae to the negative 3t. And q particular prime prime is 9ae to the negative 3t. Using that first row, we've got 2 of the second derivatives, 12 of the first derivatives, and 16 of just the q's. We only have one term that we're collecting, the e to the negative 3 t's, which is nice. So when I multiply by 16, 12, and 2, we end up with 16a, negative 36a, and 18a. And if we add all that up, we get negative 2a is equal to the 8 that we want. So a is equal to negative 4. So q's particular solution is going to be a negative 4 e to the negative 3t. Putting it all together then, Q is equal to the complementary plus the particular. So we have C1, E to the negative 2T, plus C2, E to the negative 4T, plus the particular, which is negative 4, E to the negative 3T. 
If we want to solve for C1 and C2, we need some initial conditions. So let's give ourselves some initial conditions. Let's say that I of 0 is equal to 10 and Q of 0 uh, is equal to 2. So initial conditions that I should have given at the beginning. If that's the case, we need to know what i is equal to. And what's nice is i is just the derivative of q. The current is the derivative of the charge. So our derivative is negative 2c1 e to the negative 2t minus 4c2 e to the negative 4t plus 12e to the negative 3t. And we're going to plug in our initial points on Q that was 0, 2, on I that was 0, 10. So when Q is 2, we have C1 plus C2 minus 4. Adding 4 to both sides, we get 6 is equal to C1 plus C2. For the second equation, when q is 10, or q prime is 10, i is 10, we get negative 2c1 minus 4c2 plus 12. And subtracting 12 from both sides gives us negative 2 is equal to negative 2c1 minus 4c2. And this one we can solve pretty quickly. I'm going to multiply our first equation by 2. That's going to give us 12 is equal to 2c1 plus 2c2. 10 is equal to negative 2c2. So c2 is equal to negative 5. That means if c2 is negative 5, c1 is equal to 11. Great, we've got our constants. Now we can express our final Q or our final charge is C1, 11, e to the negative 2t, plus C2, negative 5, e to the negative 4t, minus 4, e to the negative 3t. We also can express the current, which is I, and we'll just use this current equation. I is equal to negative 2C1, which is negative 22e to the negative 2t, minus 4c2, which makes it positive 20e to the negative 4t, minus 4e to the negative 3t. And now we have derived the equations for the current and the charge, i and q, to model this RCL circuit. So we kind of stick RCL circuits in here really quick at the end because it's the exact same differential equation as the oscillating motion. Now it's your turn to practice these. We're just applying the concepts we've already learned in a previous chapter. So good luck to you as you work on the assignment.